A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. The Kingdoms and the Economy, Part 2. This chapter continues our consideration of the economy of the Yoruba kingdoms from about the 11th century to the end of the 18th century. Here, we will focus on specific features and institutions of the economy. In depth studies of some of these subjects, such as royal finances, savings, credit and loan systems, have intensified in recent times, we are indebted to such studies. We will then conclude this chapter with a general 18th century economic and social overview the 18th century being the concluding century of the period covered here and in the previous chapter. Royal Finances Much, even most, of the financial resources available to the king's government in every Yoruba kingdom came from tolls and taxes on commerce. With the exception of produce from local farms, all merchandise was subject to some tolls at the gates. The unabode, gatekeeper, was therefore, in every kingdom, a very important public official usually a trusted palace servant honored with a chieftaincy title. In many kingdoms, these positions became hereditary in certain lineages, with the result that such lineages became trusted pillars of the monarchical system. The amount of revenue accruing to the government of a kingdom from tolls depended on the volume of trade, especially long-distance trade passing through its gates and for this reason governments paid very particular attention to the quality of their roads and to the protection of peace on their roads. Tolls and taxes from the king's marketplace constituted another source of income. Practice in the collection of such market tolls and taxes varied from kingdom to kingdom. In general, it was accepted by all traders that the king's servants could demand customary payments to the king on the ISO, stall or location in the market, or on particular articles of merchandise. It was also generally accepted that the king could through his servants, demand from traders payments or gifts on important state occasions like festivals, rituals and sacrifices, repairs and other work on palace buildings, and towards the support of war efforts. Palace servants usually received liberal gifts from traders for themselves on a more or less regular basis, and so did wives of the king whenever they came to the market to buy. Again, the amount of royal revenue from the various tolls, levies, and taxes from marketplaces depended on the volume of trade. The kingdoms that were great centers of trade and had many large marketplaces commanded rich treasuries. Another source of royal revenue derived from a kingdom's subordinate towns and villages, Ariko. Again, although gifts to the king on important state occasions, and contributions in men and materials to work on the palace and on city walls and to the king's war efforts, were standard practice, details of practice varied from kingdom to kingdom. Unlike most kingdoms, the Oyoila Palace seems to have developed early the practice of regular annual and seasonal levies on its subordinate towns and villages, levies graduated according to their sizes and means. At the peak of the power and greatness of the Oyo Empire, every kingdom in the Oyo country sent regular annual tributes and gifts to the Alafin. It was common practice in some kingdoms that the king occasionally sent high chiefs to visit the subordinate, or Rico, towns and villages, with the understanding that such envoys would return with rich gifts for the king. There were, moreover, in every kingdom a large number of traditional rules, observances and practices, as well as many provisions and customs of the judicial system that generated revenue, in money, materials and services, for the king. If the palace intervened and settled disputes within or between lineages or individuals, all sides were customarily required to send gifts to the king in order to thank him. When prominent members of a lineage contested a vacant chieftaincy title in their lineage, the candidate who was believed to be closest or most acceptable to the king usually had the best chance of winning among members of his own lineage. This always meant gifts to the king, and to his wives and servants, by contestants for chieftaincy titles. The traditional rules laid it down that a candidate for installation to any chieftaincy title must make some payment to the king, and the type and amount of such payment were graduated according to the importance of the title in the political system. All Yorba regarded certain animals in the wild, such as leopards and elephants, as royal property. Therefore, any hunter or farmer who killed any of them must surrender it to the king. Surrendering the skin, or in the case of the elephant, the tusks, was usually sufficient for compliance. During ceremonies, festivals, funerals, weddings, etc., any lineage that slaughtered certain types of animals, especially a cow, was customarily expected to send a part of it to the palace. Funeral rites for notable citizens included gifts to the king, and many families would make such gifts very rich as a means of bragging about the prosperity of their departed parents. In many kingdoms, gifts of this type evolved into well regulated taxes. In general, gifts to the king and the chiefs during important festivals were regarded as part of civilized life, and, in all parts of Yorubland, the rich were constantly engaged in a lively rivalry over this. Together, all of these customary payments and gifts amounted to a substantial flow of resources to the palace, 
especially if a kingdom had many rich, proud, lineages, and rich citizens, big farmers, traders, artisans. Hence the old saying that it is foolish to count the king when counting the rich people in a town, though the king might have no visible business, the cumulative flow to him from the wealth of all citizens made him much richer than even the richest citizen. Finally, Yoruba kings derived some income from their own primary production in agriculture. Many a royal town had a large plot of land immediately outside the town walls, known as Okooba or Okooa, king's farmland, where the king's servants and slaves raised crops for him on a regular basis usually out of bounds to the general populace. Apart from supplying the king's large family and palace establishment, yields from such farms also supplied the open market. Typically, when the king's servants brought his produce to the market, other traders deferred to them to let them sell it before spreading out their own goods of the same type for sale. The king usually had more servants and slaves than any of his subjects, even though many of such servants and slaves were employed in state and palace duties, the rest probably cultivated farms for the king that rival those of some of his richest subjects. As will be seen later, Yoruba rulers in the 19th century generally maintained extensive farms and in doing so, they were certainly continuing a well-established Yoruba tradition. Labor in the Economy on the lineage farmland, in the near town farms and the distant forest farms, the individual male member of a lineage was free to farm as much land as he had the capacity for with the strict provision, of course, that he should not encroach on land already being used by other members or on land deliberately left fallow. He could clear and farm any number of plots. In general, he had the right of first return to any piece of land he had first cleared a virgin forest and farmed and then left fallow. Effectively, his limitations were the labor available to him and the efficacy of his tools, hoes, cutlasses or machetes, and other iron-bladed tools like axes and knives. The primary source of the farmer's labor supply was his nuclear family himself and his teenage sons and unmarried young adult sons, assisted by his wife, or wives, and unmarried daughters. To increase this primary labor base, ambitious men married many wives and raised many children. Beyond this, there were some supplementary labor sources. Youthful married, and therefore independent, sons, as well as sons-in-law, usually came in once or twice in the year to give free assistance on particular tasks like land clearing or tilling. Then there were two systems of mutual labor pooling one called O and the other called Aro. To create, or call, an O, a farmer set a date and invited his relations, young male members of his lineage and related lineages, his sons-in-law, his married sons, his son's friends and others, to come and work with him and his family on his farm usually on heavier tasks like cutting the bush or tilling the soil. Labor given on O was pure grant, it did not have to be repaid or reciprocated. O usually lasted one day or, at the longest, two, and was commonly called by ambitious farmers as well as by older farmers past their prime. Depending on the number of men present, it could get a lot of work done especially because it was usually characterized by a lively rivalry among the young men. RO was a system of labor pooling by a group of friends to work in rotation on one another's farms. The O or RO day was usually a day of work and fun, with food and palm wine provided by the host for the lunch break and the end of the day. Hired farm labor also existed. Usually a married young man would, in addition to work on his own farm, set some time aside to hire out his labor for some income in cash or kind, especially seed yam. Sometimes, such young men would form a work team and go around to offer their services to one big farmer after another, even far beyond their own towns or villages. Also, a young man faced with a projected large expenditure, for a parent's funeral, a parent's installation as chief, or his own plan to take one more wife, might partly shut down his own farming for a season in order to go and accumulate cash, either through a series of quick farm jobs or through one long employment with a substantial farmer. Available for employment in the same way on farms were young men who had completed their training as apprentices in a trade or craft and needed money to perform the prescribed ritual and celebration of their graduation. Exploiting combinations of these sources of labor, an ambitious farmer could cultivate as large a farm as the technology, the iron-bladed machetes and hoes, made possible. Within this context, quite sizable farms became generally common all over Yoruba land. No doubt, most farmers produced for subsistence or just a little above it, but the most ambitious went far beyond the level of subsistence farming and established extensive farms for the market, becoming thereby men of considerable wealth. At some point or other in their history, most lineages had one or two such great farmers, and their accomplishments passed into the lineage praise poetry, or Ricky. For the manufacturers and the craftsmen, the most important source of labor was the apprenticeship system. To become a blacksmith, coppersmith or artist, cloth weaver, mat weaver, raffia products weaver, 
cane and rattan craftsman, wood sculptor, carpenter, mud wall builder, tailor, herbalist, diviner, etc., a young person had to learn under a master. Each industry or craft had its own number of years for apprenticeship, and the apprentices, as they matured in training, served as the master's labor force. After training, some would remain behind and become part of the master's permanent staff, others would go to work for other masters or start out on their own. For production, master manufacturers and artisans also employed a system of subcontracting jobs to smaller people. In the cotton weaving industry, for instance, large scale producers, as a supplement to the labor directly available to them, often had to farm out weaving jobs to people in the community. Women and men who had good weaving skills but who were engaged mostly in other pursuits, nursing mothers, small traders, farmers, for example, would register their names with the large-scale producer, and the latter would contract weaving jobs to them whenever needed. Such contract workers were paid in cash and therefore, contract jobs were a good source of income for many small people in the community. In the case of the contract weaver, known as Alog Barun, it was the duty of the large-scale producer to give clear specifications of the cloth to be woven and to supply the appropriate lengths and colors of yarn. A woman Alec Bawan worked on her own pit loom in her own home compound. The men's weaving facility was more elaborate and more expensive to create, therefore a male Alec Bawan usually rented or begged working space in a facility near his home. Apart from its use in various types of production, this system was also used in the raising of the typical Yoruba livestock goats, sheep, hens, etc. Under this arrangement, the richer woman gave to the poorer female animal, known as Aranosan, for her to take care of in her own home compound. According to an ancient rule, the owner took the animal's first offspring, and then shared subsequent offspring equally with the caretaker. In this way, a rich woman could have very many heads of livestock scattered throughout her community. On the other hand, the system enabled poorer women to own some livestock. Commerce leaned heavily on large numbers of porters to convey merchandise. Small traders, like women taking some goods from their homes or from their husbands' farms to the local marketplace, carried their own goods, usually assisted by young members of their family. The small long-distance trader taking goods to markets in neighboring towns or villages usually employed a few porters. The major long-distance trader employed tens or even hundreds of porters, usually traveling together with groups of other traders' porters in caravans. Porters were usually young people mostly young women. Although young men were not excluded from earning some quick income in this trade. Probably most Yoruba women had some experience of portering in their youth. The average young woman would usually offer her service in conveying merchandise from her town to another town a few miles away, on her way back home she would convey goods for another employer. For a trader well known to her and her family, she might carry goods to very distant places across the country or even beyond. Many long distance traders started as long distance porter. On waterways, on main rivers like the Ogun and on the coastal lagoons, goods were conveyed on canoes, mostly small dugouts. Ilahe boatmen were the most famous Yoruba in the canoe trade. The average Ilahe young man owned his own canoe with which he fished and, from time to time, conveyed goods for traders for pay. Some of the more substantial citizens in the Ilahe and coastal Ijebu and Awari country owned many canoes, operated by hired hands, usually youths working part-time, and employed in carrying goods for traders. Canoe men from among the neighboring Ija were usually intermingled with Yorubas, Itsakiri, Ilahe, Ijebu and Awari, as carriers on the Yoruba coast. Women were the backbone of commerce in Yoruba land. As earlier pointed out, some who later became big traders started as porters. Others started small trading as girls, buying goods from a village in their region and selling in another village or town. For instance, buying pots from the royal town of Isan in northern Akiti, as well as from Ar in the Akul Kingdom or Obo in the Yadu Kingdom. For sale in other Akiti towns was a favorite beginner's trade for Akiti girls. On the market days in these pot manufacturing towns, crowds of young women usually arrived from all over Akiti, each departing at the end of the day carrying a stack of new pots. The small capital needed to start this trade was usually begged or borrowed from parents, or gradually built up through the mutual saving system known as Isisu. Carrying stacks of pots was a hard task, but with luck and persistence, the small trade in pots could grow and diversify into other merchandise. Similar opportunities existed in all regions of Yoruba land for young women to start some trading salt and dried fish on the coastal lagoons, different types of cloth in various parts of the country, dried fish from the Niger, dye stuff in the towns of the Asin Valley, locust bean aromatics, or iru, processing and sale by young women in the grasslands of northern Yoruba land, carved specialty calabashes from many parts of Ekiti, Ijesa, Igbamana, and Oyo, 
raw leather as well as finished leather goods from the Oyo country, where the town of Shaki was perhaps the most famous leather market, small-sized earthen pots and vessels, for cooking soups, and for use as dishes, ceremonial vessels, decorations, and medicinal crucibles, from various towns scattered all over the country, cosmetic camwood, or asin, from the towns and villages of Owo and southern Ekiti, especially Akuri, shea butter from the Igbomana country and from the Noop country on the Niger, grinding stones from Ekiti and Akoko. With the advent of trade with Europe from the 16th century, a whole new range of merchandise entered into the trade. Traders from Benin, the Asia coast and the Yoruba coast, Itsekiri, Ilohe, Ikale, Ijebu and Awari, first brought the European goods for distribution in the Yoruba interior, were experienced, knowledgeable and well-connected local traders established trading relationships that enabled them to obtain more and more of the European goods for sale. Another common means whereby the rich acquired labor, for their farming, manufacturing and trading, was through the system known as Iwofa, the pawning of persons. Very early in their history, the Yoruba seemed to have created this system, whereby a borrower agreed to pawn himself or herself, or, more commonly, a young relative, to the creditor as security for a debt. This was an agreement freely contracted between the creditor and the borrower and witnessed by important persons like chiefs or palace officials. The creditor and the borrower agreed that the pawned person would serve the creditor until the debt was fully paid. As soon as the debt was fully paid, the pawned person was set free. A pawned person could not be ill-treated or humiliated, if ill-treatment or humiliation was satisfactorily proved before the authorities, the agreement lapsed instantly and the creditor had no further claims on the debtor. If the pawned person was a grown-up girl, the creditor, or any member of his or her lineage, could not marry her, any such marriage instantly discharged the debt. The death of the pawned person terminated the agreement and fully discharged the debt, that is why creditors usually insisted on healthy young persons as pawns. If the pawned person ran away and could not be found, the debtor must provide a substitute or pay the debt. Pawning, therefore, was not slavery, it was freely negotiated, limited, servitude. There was no odium or stigma attached to it, it was generally regarded as an honorable way whereby a person in desperate need of money could borrow it from a rich person. It was a favorite method of raising capital for business and the rich usually preferred to enter into it with persons who intended to use the money for business, especially trade or quick production of goods like cloth to meet pressing market demands. The Iwofa system was commonly used in all parts of Yoruba land, and the typical wealthy farmer or trader or large manufacturer or artisan usually had some pawn persons in his or her labor force. Finally, Yoruba people also had an old institution of domestic slavery, but, as the available evidence overwhelmingly suggests, and as has been shown above, Domestic slavery does not seem to have accounted for a significant proportion of labor in Yoruba land until the last decades of the 18th century. Before the late 18th century, owning of domestic slaves was almost entirely a monopoly of the ruling classes of society. Women in the Economy The importance of Yoruba women in the economy of their country deserves a special treatment in this chapter. Unlike most other West African peoples whose women did some of even the heaviest and roughest farm tasks, the Yoruba regarded farming as an exclusively male occupation. In practice, this translated to the exclusion of women from the heavier farm tasks cutting the bush, tilling the soil, weeding the growing crops, some of the heavier planting, especially seed yam planting, and the most demanding categories of harvesting, like digging up yams or harvesting nuts or palm wine from palm trees. In all these tasks, the job assigned to women was to provide backup services to their men to cook while the men worked, fetch water, carry supplies, like seed yam from storage to the farm, or harvested crops like yams to storage, or palm nuts to the processing facility. Women were also responsible for carrying farm produce to the points of sale and for selling it. Women did all the light harvesting of maize, beans and cotton, as well as the gathering of kala nuts, shea nuts and locust bean fruits, to mention only a few. While the Yoruba woman did not, unlike women in many other West African cultures, do the heaviest farming tasks, her contributions to the agricultural economy were absolutely indispensable to its prosperity. Yoruba women also were responsible for much of manufacturing and for most crafts and arts. Heavier industrial processes like metal smelting and its ancillaries, like metal fabrication or sculpturing, belonged only to men, as did the rougher aspects of home construction like the building of walls and roofs. But almost all others belonged to the province of women the weaving of cotton cloth and raffia products, production of yarn from raw cotton, almost all dyeing processes, the making of pots and other ceramic goods, glass and bead production production of mats and the finer baskets. 
both men and women sewed garments, though men predominated in the making of beaded goods like crowns and other royal articles. When men had finished constructing a building, the women took over and did the entire plastering and decorating. The very important industry of oil processing from palm nuts engaged more men than women, but the contributions by women were significant. Women gathered, shelled, cleaned and dried the kala nuts for market, an important export-oriented industry of the Yoruba forests. Much more so than women in any other African cultural group, Yoruba women dominated the commercial life of their country. From the smallest local trading to the largest long-distance trading, women were the operators. Women created the trade networks that molded Yoruba land's market districts and subdistricts, and the longer trading relationships that connected it with the rest of West Africa. Yoruba people were used to trading with men traders from, and in, other lands, yet Yoruba culture always regarded trade as a woman's enterprise and never put any considerable number of men in commercial pursuits before the late 18th century. After Olokun, the rich Ifeb trader of Odujua's generation, we do not have names of the great women traders until the 19th century. But Yoruba traditions in general are unambiguous that women controlled commercial wealth in Yoruba land and that every city or town had a long succession of rich women traders. Savings and Capital Formation in the Economy The emergence of widespread urban centers in Yoruba land consequent upon the creation of the kingdoms produced major transformations in agriculture, manufactures and commerce. In the context of such developments, major changes also arose in such important economic activities as the saving of money for significant economic and social needs. Though there may have been rudimentary practices in such matters in times before the kingdoms and the urban centers, it was almost certainly in the urban setting that the influential Yoruba systems known to us today evolved namely, Aho and Isasu, as well as Yoruba money lending institutions. The growth of comparatively large farms for regular production of surpluses for urban populations, the establishment of, and supply to, large urban workshops, the growth of long-distance large-scale trading, as seen, for instance in the activities of the Ilahapa and Alarobo, and higher levels of expenditure on family occasions, like funerals, chieftaincy installations, or weddings, in the urban setting all these almost certainly generated the savings systems, the beginnings of capital formation and the money borrowing and lending systems that the Yoruba people evolved. Aho is a shortened form of the word Ikojo, meaning that which is gathered or pulled together or the act of gathering together. The traditions concerning Aho strongly suggest that it started in early urban practices whereby individuals saved money with notable persons in their social and family circles for instance, residents of Agboila with Agboila elders, members of age-grade associations with the officers of their associations, members of market commodity associations with the more substantial traders in their associations. From such beginnings, there developed the institution of the Ilaho that is, a person, usually a significant citizen, like a chief or successful trader, trusted for his or her integrity, who made a profession of receiving and saving money for other citizens. To avoid confusion, it developed that each individual depositor had to deposit the same amount of money at regular intervals of time say every Orun, 5-day, or Isan, 9-day, market day. To receive back the accumulated savings, the depositor must give the Ilaho an advance notice, the length of which was agreed to at the beginning of the relationship. A depositor's last installment constituted a payment to the Ilaho for his or her services. The accumulated deposits did not earn any interest. It was common for the Ilaho to offer this service until grand old age. As should be easily obvious, the Aho system suffered an important weakness, its level of security was low. The Ilaho was often also a money lender, which meant that he sometimes loaned out some of the money received from depositors. If any of the loans went bad, the Ilaho's obligations to some depositors were likely to be disrupted, and such depositors would suffer loss or, at least, painful delays in receiving their money back. Sometimes, on the other hand, the disruption emanated from depositors if any depositor failed to bring in the deposits as arranged, he could slow down the Ilaho's fulfillment of his obligations to other depositors. Still, the Aho system had its attraction, especially as a result of its simplicity, the depositor had a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship with the Ilaho, and could give notice and call in his or her money whenever he or she chose. Consequently, the Aho system lived on quite strongly, and it was considerably modified and strengthened by the coming of literacy from about the late 19th century. Side by side with the Aho system, however, there evolved another system that was much more secure, that was participated in by many more people in every town and that had a much bigger impact on the economy. This system was known as Isasu. Isasu is from the Yoruba word su, meaning poor. As used in this financial system, poor has two meanings poor as in poor together, or pool together, and poor as in pour out, or disperse. 
In its operation, ISISU ran as a pooling and dispersing of funds at predetermined intervals of time, in a chain stretching over a predetermined length of time. Samuel Johnson describes the operation of an ISISU as follows, a fixed sum agreed upon is given by each, member, at a fixed time, usually every week, and place, under a president, the total amount is paid to each member in rotation. And a 20th century scholar, using the English pound and shilling currency of his time, has illustrated the operation of an ISISU thus. Imagine a simple case where 20 members contribute one shilling each, monthly. At the end of 20 months, which completes the cycle in this case, each member will have contributed 20 shillings or one pound and will, on one occasion, have received the amount of one pound in return. ISISU pervaded all of Yoruba land and, usually, many ISISU groups existed at any given time in every Yoruba town. The smallest and simplest ISISU consisted of a few members, say 20, who, under the leadership of one member as president, agreed to contribute a fixed amount of money at agreed intervals, say weekly. Each member would bring his or her contribution to the president at the agreed place on the agreed day of every week, usually the local market day. After receiving all the contributions for the day, the president would give all of it together to one member, which member was said to gather, or co, the ISISU for that day. The order in which members would gather the ISISU was agreed to in a meeting of all members before the first contribution was made usually with the assistance of the IFA oracle. This example, then, would be described as a 20-member 20-week ISISU. In most cases, such a simple 20-week ISISU would operate for 21 weeks, so that each member would make 21 contributions and receive the total sum of 20 contributions, the contributions of the first week being kept by the president to cushion the operation, so that unavoidable lateness by members to bring in their contributions would not harm any member whose turn it was to gather the ISISU. Usually, depending on the community, the first contribution being thus withheld would end up, at the end of the cycle, as a thank you gift to the president for her services although the president was also usually expected to end the cycle with light refreshments for the group. Lateness by any member in bringing in a contribution was treated as a very serious offense, and default was out of the question. Penalties were always stated in advance usually including fines or expulsion, and the terrible possibility of refusal of admission to future ISISU groups. A member who was expelled lost her place on the list of members and must wait till the end of the cycle to receive back whatever she had contributed. ISISU varied very widely in size, number of members, duration, and complexity of operation. An ISISU in the largest categories could comprise over 200 members and have a duration of over two years. The membership of a complex ISISU might have internal subgroups, each under a leader who is responsible for collecting the contributions from members of his or her subgroup. In such cases, it was the subgroup leaders only that dealt directly with the group president. Often, subgroup leaders were persons who were using the position to understudy the group president in preparation for starting ISISU groups of their own. Every ISISU accommodated within itself persons of little income and the economically more comfortable. This was done by institutionalizing the agreed amount of each individual installment and calling it OWO, hand. While a weaker member might hold only one hand, OWO Khan, in an ISISU, a richer member might hold two or three. This meant that the former would make one contribution, while the latter made two or three, and that the former would occupy one spot on the list of members, for gathering the ISISU, while the latter would occupy two or three dispersed spots. The ISISU system was one of the most sophisticated inventions of Yoruba economic life. Although we have no documentary mention of it before the 19th century, Yoruba traditions in general are unambiguous that ISISU had its earliest roots in the ancient Yoruba tradition of pooling assets for the mutual benefit of persons in groups. Of such practices, mention has been made of O and RO systems of labor pooling and farm work. One other was the Ouoya system, in which women spinners of cotton yarn pooled an agreed length of yarn weekly or thereabouts, the collective contribution of each week being gathered by one member exactly as an ISISU. Created in the cities and towns most probably in the early history of the kingdoms, the ISISU system of monetary asset pooling was the peak invention of this whole cultural trend. At the height of its development, ISISU was three things in one a societal bonding organization, a vehicle for savings and capital accumulation, and a mutual credit institution. Typically, membership of any one ISISU spanned various lineages and lineage compounds, various age-grade associations, various occupations, various strata of society, sometimes even various neighboring towns. As such, an ISISU bonded together many traditional segments of society, as well as the rich with the poor. Also, Membership of an ISISU constituted a very reliable way to save money and create some significant capital. It enabled its members to put money together gradually with a level of discipline beyond what they could have mustered as individuals. 
the total amount of savings generated through ESUSA week by week, month by month, in an average Yoruba city or town must have been very large indeed. For all cities and towns of Yoruba land for, say, one whole year, the savings generated by all ESUSA must have constituted an enormous capital. It is believed that probably most of the capital that came into individuals' hands through ISUSU was consumed in family and social events like funerals, chieftaincy contests, chieftaincy installations, weddings, individual and family rituals and festivals. But, from the hands of traders, artisans, cotton cloth producers, owners of dyeing stations, EDRO, and others like them, some of the capital from ISUSU went into the expansion of trade, and into production facilities and supplies. For instance, the giant earthen pots that were sunk into the ground and used for dyeing were so expensive that to buy one, not to talk of buying a few to establish a dyeing station, one needed the kind of capital derivable from an isisu. The long-distance trader, the ilahapa, the local wholesaler, the large-scale retailer in the local marketplace, the sellers of expensive, and therefore capital-intensive, merchandise like livestock, metal goods, export kalanuts, the owners of metal working establishments all usually had deep roots in the ISUSU system for the capital needs of their businesses. Although precise data and numbers on the impact of the ISUSU system on the economy are unavailable to modern historians, there seems to be no doubt that substantial parts of the high peaks of the Yoruba economy before the 20th century relied very much on the ISUSU system. Finally, in effect, when a member of an ISUSU, with the exception of the last member on the members list, gathered the contributions, he or she took a loan from the ISISU group, a loan secured by his or her continued contributions. Such loans were interest-free and were available only to members. Altogether, then, the ISISU system served many of the purposes that banks serve today. It provided for savings, for loans and credit, as well as for capital formation for all sorts of capital needs. Because of its great impact on economic life for many centuries, it has continued to exercise much influence in Yoruba society today in spite of the proliferation of banks and similar financial institutions. Open Loans and Credit Systems The loans available in the ISISU system were closed loans that is, they were not available to the general public but only to members. However, there were other types of loans that developed in the Yoruba cities and towns, systems making loans and credit available to the general public. Rich traders were probably the earliest providers of open loans in most new urban centers, but over time, there arose persons known uniquely as money lenders usually traders or aloha who increased money lending in their businesses or who converted completely to money lending. Since these loans carried interest, money lenders were known as low OL providers of interest-bearing loans. Interest on loans was not always in cash, quite often it was in the form of human labor or in goods and products. For instance, the Iwofa system, earlier described, did not only provide security for a loan, it also provided interest on the loan. The borrower gave a pawned person to serve the lender, but still had to pay the loan in full. As long as the loan was not fully paid, the pawned person continued to serve the lender. The pawned person's service to the lender was therefore a very exorbitant interest on the loan. Hence the common experience was that loans covered with Iwofa arrangements tended to be paid back more quickly than other types of loans. Very similar to loans covered by Iwofa arrangements was another type of loan designed especially for borrowers who were farmers. These were usufruct loans for which the borrowers pledged farms. The farm pledged could be either of annual crops like yams, cereals, legumes, cotton, etc., or of perennial crops like kalanuts or indigo. If the farm was of an annual crop, the borrower surrendered the farm as security and pledged the harvest thereof as the loan repayment and the lender was therefore entitled to come whenever the crop was ripe and harvested. Almost invariably, the cash value of the harvest far exceeded the amount of the loan thus returning to the lender a heavy interest on the loan. The lender's security and profit were even better in the case of perennial crops, since the lender, while holding the farm as security, would keep harvesting it until the loan was otherwise repaid the harvests thus constituting a usurious interest on his loan. In short, the city or town money lenders often did very well for themselves in their dealings with farming folks. Usually, most farmers worked two or more farms, if the need arose to borrow money. The practice was to set one of the farms aside for the loan transaction. Some money lenders dealt only in cash that is, cash loans and cash repayments and interest. Each such money lender usually had a standard length of time for his or her loans, at the end of which the loan and interest had to be paid together. Again, the interest rate was usually very high, commonly 100% for one year, which made calculation easy. For people of small means, taking this type of loan was very risky. 
Consequently, only the most desperate availed themselves of such loans persons faced with sudden funeral expenses or under pressure to pay older and troublesome debts or strangers who had no other source of funds to turn to. Occasionally, owners of businesses resorted to this type of loan to raise quick funds for urgent business needs. In the recovery of capital and interest in cash, default was more often experienced than in the recovery of other types of loans. The excessively high interest rates tended to load borrowers with burdens that could prove too heavy, a situation that greatly increased money lenders' risks. However, since rich money lenders were members of the politically influential elite, the rulers of society allowed them to employ draconian methods of debt recovery and such methods came to be emulated generally by others who had debts to collect. The creditor would usually start by reporting a difficult debtor to the debtor's lineage head or to his street chief and that would usually prove sufficient. Failure at those levels might ultimately lead to reporting to the quarter chief of the debtor's quarter of the town. Commonly, a chief would set a mandatory date for payment, or dates for installment payments, and then put in place a follow-up arrangement to ensure that his orders were carried out. Reporting debtors to the palace was uncommon, if the debtor kept evading payment at all these levels, he risked punishment. He also risked the probability that the creditor might obtain official permission to employ a legalized rare pressure as a last resort namely, the use of a paid, licensed, distrainer. Samuel Johnson describes the procedure as follows. The Yorubas have a peculiar method of forcing payment out of an incorrigible debtor. When a creditor who has obtained judgment for debt finds it impossible to recover anything out of the debtor, he applies to the town authorities for a licensed distrainer. This individual is called Dogo, he is said to Dogo i.e. to sit on the debtor, as it were. For that purpose, he enters the premises, seeks out the debtor, or ensconces himself in his apartment until his appearance, and then he makes himself an intolerable nuisance to him and to the members of the house generally until the money is paid. The distrainer is a man of imperturbable temper, but of a foul tongue, a veritable thersites. He adopts any measure he likes, sometimes by inflicting his presence and attention on the debtor everywhere and anywhere he may go, denying him privacy of any kind and in the meantime using his tongue most foully upon him, his own person being inviolable, for touching him implies doing violence to the person of the authorities who appoint him to the task. He demands and obtains whatever diet he may require, however sumptuous, and may help himself if not quickly served. If he thinks fit, he may hold on any poultry or cattle he finds in the premises, and prepare himself food, and all at the expense of the debtor. He must not take anything away but he may enjoy the use of anything he finds in the house. This obnoxious process was usually very effective in the recovery of debts, because it targeted not only the debtor but also the lineage compound where he lived. The distrainer could easily bring a stigma upon a compound and its residents, and, in any case, his antics were a distasteful disruption of life in the compound. Therefore, the common experience was that the residents would intervene, either by contributing money to pay the debt or by collectively offering to the creditor a satisfactory payment arrangement. The use of a distrainer could, however, prove ineffective if the debtor was disreputable in his compound on account of his being a habitual difficult debtor who had brought in distrainers or other debt-related troubles in the past. In such a case the creditor was out of luck except that he might obtain permission from the authorities to seize and hold valuables, especially livestock, belonging to the creditor or his closest of kin until the debt was paid. Besides the various types of loans, Yoruba urban communities also had a strong tradition of purchasing goods on credit. At the highest levels of commerce, Credit was a very important factor in the business relationship between local traders and the long-distance merchants who brought European and other goods for distribution in the interior. Such long-distance wholesalers, and the interior-based long-distance trader, the Ilahapa, who took merchandise to distant markets, commonly depended, for their trade, on relationships of trust with significant local retailers. At the level of retailers, too, selling on credit was a regular feature of business. Upon this tradition of commercial credit, a notable practice was developed by itinerant Ijessa traders in about the 18th century. Going from town to town, these Ijessa traders, always men, went to people in their homes and retailed to them short lengths of imported European cloth throughout the length and breadth of Yoruba land, probably most of it in the Oyo cities and towns where the levels of affluence and fashion were quite high in the 17th and 18th centuries. The trader would come, make a sale on credit and move on, to return on other rounds later to collect payment, usually in small installments. The Ijessa traders engaged in this style of trade came to be known as Asamalo from the methods they sometimes had to use for collecting the more difficult debts. The Asamalo would station himself on the homestead of the difficult debtor, and announce repeatedly that he absolutely would not leave until he had been paid which, in his Ijessa dialect, was rendered as Osanimalo Gbowomi, I am going to keep crouching here until I receive my money. 
the Asimalo was usually himself under great pressure. Quite often, he had received his consignment of cloth on credit from a bigger merchant, or he was no more than a small subsidiary to a bigger merchant, he must pay his principal and make some profit for himself, and he could not afford to abandon even the smallest debts. So he would crouch rather than sit, because that way he had a better chance to attract everybody's attention to his difficult plight and to the debtor's lack of consideration. The Asimalo was, in his own way, an important agent of cultural change and progress. He brought in expensive cloth of European manufacture to all cities and towns of Eurobland, and made it available to all, including even the poor, on deferred payments which he was willing to receive in easy installments. Usually, most of his transactions went smoothly, and only in few cases did he need to crouch to compel payment. Some of the more successful Asimalo had subordinates to assist and represent them while they made wide sweeps of the country. Of the smallest ones, each usually confined his rounds to a given district. The Asimalo continued to be important in the commercial life of Yoruba land until deep into the 20th century. An 18th century overview. In spite of a perceptible decline in human rights and security in parts of Yoruba land by the end of the 18th century, on the whole it marked a climax to the centuries of growing socio-economic prosperity. By the end of that century, Yoruba land was a country of many rich towns and villages, many of including very large walled cities, prosperous farms growing a large variety of crops, well-kept and peaceful roads bearing endless streams of travelers and traders conveying various types of merchandise, a proud land of culture in the arts, crafts and entertainment. By the 18th century, the lineage compound, Agbo Ila, had reached its peak in beauty and decoration and comfort much of which could be seen until well into the 20th century. The average compound featured large verandas around the courtyards and low eaves, which together protected the living and sleeping rooms from sun, heat and glare, wooden posts, supporting the eaves, and wooden door panels all carved in great detail, very detailed wall colorings and decorations, often with furrowed patterns and inscriptions that had symbolic meanings to the lineage, and, commonly, a small garden in which herbs were grown, and a compound frontage planted with decorative shade trees. In every town, these compound beautifications had their most glorious expressions in the king's palace and, to a lesser extent, in the compounds of the high chiefs. The Yoruba culture of color, music and gaiety in festivals, ceremonies, funerals and weddings, so often marveled at in the 20th century by neighboring peoples, had attained its maturity by the 18th century. In royal cities across the land, kings ruled in varying grades of splendor, adorned in beaded regalia and the proud, beaded crown of Oduduwa, with a long white feather, known as Iroken, swaying on top of it. Every palace, expanded and refined down the centuries, proclaimed the glory of its king by its grand gate, its gabled roof, its sculptured pillars and its many courtyards each of which had a function, a name and a history. Masses of the residents of every royal city gathered in the palace on those festivals when the king, adorned in his best, his face veiled behind the shimmering beaded frills of his crown, with a beaded scepter in his hand, graciously showed his person to his adoring subjects. When he spoke to the crowd, one of his chiefs echoed his voice and his every word was greeted with a torrent of Ricky praise poetry from thousands of voices. The huge drums of royalty known as Gbedu drums, their wooden trunks gorgeous specimens of sculptural art, boomed to play some royal beat and, depending on the kind of festival, the king danced a brief series of steps to an ancient royal song laced with history as his people roared their adoration. If this was the royal festival of Ogun, god of iron and war, the king would step beyond the palace gate on a procession through certain parts of the city, with his chiefs and thousands of his subjects in his train, in loud jubilation. A brief survey of some of the kingdoms will illustrate this general picture of peace, stability and prosperity. The Elisa kingdom was at the peak of its power and prosperity, reached during the glorious reign of the warrior king, Oatakun Mosa, in the last years of the 17th century, see Chapter 8. Elisa's trade with Oyo in the north and Benin in the south prospered, Igesa traders ranked among the best in Yoruba land both in commercial expertise and versatility, and in the range of their operations, as colonies of Igesa traders mushroomed as far west as places that are today in Togo and Ghana. Many of the Akiti kingdoms joined the ranks of the richest Yoruba kingdoms. The cognomens of two of the Yui who ruled the Adu kingdom for most of the century speak loudly of prosperity, comfort and peace. The Yui Amanuola, meaning he who knows the road to wealth, reigned, according to Anthony Oguntuyi from 1722 to 1762 a long reign celebrated in Adu traditions for its prosperity and glory. Amanawala's successor, Afun Biowo, meaning white as money that is cowries, reigned from 1762 to 1781, also in great wealth and splendor, although his subjects complained of him that he was greedy and crafty. 
Various traditions, sayings and proverbs project a picture of wealth and beauty in most Akiti kingdoms prior to the 19th century. The Akol kingdom was pictured as being so rich in cloth production and sales that Akol people used to clothe the trees in their streets, while the Alekol's regalia used to spread out in folds after folds. Akiti people sang of the kings of some of their richest kingdoms, like the Yui of Adu, the Alekol of Akol, the Deji of Akure and the Alara of Ara, as being so rich that parts of their stores of money, in cowries, needed to be spread in the open to wear every day. And one piece of poetry had it that when the Yui went on the annual ritual visit to a shrine called Atu, the priests there became rich from the beads that dropped from his clothes and that all the bush along the way twinkled with lost beads. According to Ijeba traditions, the 18th century was a period of surpassing prosperity, stability and greatness for the Ijebu Ode kingdom, as well as for most of the other Ijebu kingdoms. The Ijebu Ode kings of the period bore such grand cognomens as Twagbuwa, he who had power and glory placed gently in his hands, Belagbuwa, he to whom power and glory came in the peace of his home, Fusangbuwa, he who celebrated to receive power and glory. These kings were perhaps the richest in southern Yoruba land in their time. Ijebuo did enormous amounts of trade with the interior and the coast. The names of the most influential eight great associations in Ijebuo during the century proclaimed the peace and stability of the time such names as Leg Beta, Luoru, and Isles Gun. By the end of the century, this kingdom seems to have started buying some guns for its armies the first Yoruba kingdom to do so. Ijebu traders, tutored by the experience of many centuries, were reputed to be the best among the Yoruba and were a major source of imported European goods. They traversed Yoruba land intensively, set up agreements with local traders everywhere, and settled as wholesalers in almost all prominent towns. Recent studies show that Ijebu and the other Ijebu towns were centers of great art in brass, bronze, terracotta and wood. Egypt's direct access to the European coastal trade made brass abundantly available, greatly enhancing sculptural art in this medium, and strong contacts and trade with Owo and Benin added to the richness of the art of the Ijebu country. Under the umbrella of the Alafin of Oyo, the Owo and Igba kingdoms enjoyed much prosperity for most of the 18th century. The same was true of the kingdom of Ila in the north. Shielded by Oyo Ila from frequent incursions by Noop raiders, this kingdom at last began to derive full benefits from its location on the trade routes connecting Yoruba land with the Noop country on the Niger. It was during the 18th century that the glory of the Orangun of Ila, widely respected as one of the oldest Yoruba dynasties, had a chance to glow. Osog Boy's long reign in the 17th century had raised the power of the Owo kingdom to great heights, more or less permanently securing Owo against Benin invasions. But it had also introduced elements of the Benin style of monarchy characterized by a strong dose of royal autocracy. The conflicts between this style of monarchy and the Yoruba tradition of limited monarchy caused instability in Owo's political system for a long time after Osog Boy. But the Owo kingdom proved adroit at expanding economic prosperity even in spite of its constitutional troubles. The 18th century was therefore the most glorious era in Owo's history. Free from disruptions caused by Benin's military threats, Owo's trade with Benin reached great heights. Owo and Benin traders mingled freely on the Owo Benin routes as well as in all parts of eastern and southern Yoruba land. Owo's traditions speak of a new class of very rich citizens, mostly traders, of prosperous farming and plentiful supplies of food, of a new era of bountiful industrial and artistic production. Owo's cloth industry boomed, and in particular, Owo became the new center, clearly at last replacing Ife for manufacturing the beaded products of Yoruba royal grandeur crowns, scepters, etc. Working at home in Owo or scattered abroad as protégés of various Yoruba kings, Owo bead setters made the new generation of Odudua crowns for Yoruba land. Second only to Oyo Ila, Owo experienced a ferment in the entertainment arts. Various types of new drums and musical instruments, various styles of popular music, many colorful troops of musicians, went out from Owo and gave most of Yoruba land many bright new additions to its popular entertainment. The 18th century is also believed to have witnessed the height of Owo's art in brass-slash-bronze sculptures, terracotta sculptures, ivory carving, etc. Indeed, the available evidence suggests that by this time Owo had come to surpass Ife in the arts. Owo developed the art of carving ivory to perfection, and became the major supplier of ivory figurines to both Yoruba land and Benin. Artfully mixing Yoruba and Benin royal regalia, with its superabundance of beads, the Olawa was shown, as their subjects said, like the sun in the sky, and attracted streams of spectators from all over Yoruba land to some of the annual royal festivals of Owo. The 18th century also saw the peak of Owo's expansion, as a result of which the Olawa could claim that most of Akoko belonged to his kingdom. In the far western region of Yoruba land, 
Ketu was the most successful and most powerful Yoruba kingdom. As the pressure of Dahomey on its neighbors increased during the century, Ketu was better able than the rest to resist, defeating a Dahomey attack in 1760. Ketu fared less well against another Dahomey attack in 1789, but was still able to claim victory when it was over. At home, this kingdom enjoyed much stability under its own version of the Yoruba constitution of limited monarchy. Its council called Kobalid, meaning, teach the king to speak, made up of between 60 and 70 chiefs, acted as a sort of parliament that met with the king regularly to take all decisions of state. The traditions of Ketu speak of considerable prosperity under its late 18th century king Zuya, 174,860, Ande, 176,080, and Aki Bayaru, 178,095. Many of the trade routes connecting Oyoila with the Asia and Western Yoruba countries benefited Ketu and brought much wealth to its citizens. One of the Ketu towns, Meko, grew particularly rich during the century. No written eyewitness descriptions of Yoruba land beyond the coast in the centuries covered in this chapter, 11th to 18th century, are available. From the first years of the 19th century, however, travel accounts of European visitors to the Yoruba interior began to furnish such descriptions. By the time that the first of these visitors, Hugh Clapperton, came in the 1820s, the western and northwestern parts of Yoruba land were, as earlier pointed out, already experiencing some political troubles. Even then, the records of Clapperton and his companions paint a picture that gives a lot of information about what Yoruba land must have been like in the 18th century. Clapperton and his team, including notably his servant Richard Lander, started from Badagri on the Yoruba west coast at the end of December 1825 intent on collecting information about the course of River Niger. Traveling slowly northwards through western Yoruba land, they made it to Oyoila in late January 1826. What they had to say about the generally good and peaceful condition of the roads and of traveling traders and marketplaces has been earlier touched upon. Here we will note some of their minor observations about the general civilization and conditions of Yoruba land. From the moment they left Badagri, the group never had to go any long distance before coming to a town. They were traveling through a well-populated country, with towns and villages not far apart. Outside every town or village, according to Lander, were fields of Indian corn, numerous plantations of cotton, extensive plantations of corn and plantains, rich plantations of yams. After they had emerged from the thicker forest territory near the coast, they saw palm trees growing abundantly everywhere, sometimes appearing to belong to plantations. In the farmlands after Ayana, Lander recorded that they saw groves of cocoa and female cocoa trees, scattered on all sides by which he presumably meant coconut trees. After a town whose name he recorded as Choco, Lander wrote that they came through some low mountains, on the summit and in the hollows of which were several hamlets, inhabited by an industrious race, who had extensive plantations in the valleys below, where the palm tree flourishes in great abundance. They were probably, at this point, passing through an area of forest farms, Okoegan. Lander observed that as his group penetrated further and further into the Yoruba interior, the population generally grew denser, the towns grew bigger, the land got more intensively cultivated, and civilization became at every step more strikingly apparent. Large towns he wrote, at the distance of only a few miles from each other, lay on all sides. He tried to guess the population sizes of some of the towns. The town which he called Koofo, around which, according to him, several extensive cotton plantations lay he thought, had a population of about 20,000, though an Englishman, used to the small family homes of his own country, would naturally underestimate the population of a town filled with packed, sprawling, lineage compounds. He did not attempt to guess the population of Shaki, but recorded that it was a populous town, and that its king had a considerable number of towns, and many thousands of people, under his protection. About many other towns, he simply wrote that they were densely inhabited. Lander found the location of many of the towns to be well chosen, attractive and very impressive. So likewise were their layout and decorations. Biji, he said, was a pleasant town, Labu was delightfully situated on rising ground, commanding an extensive and noble prospect, the approach to it is through a beautiful walk of trees. The city of Shaki was perched attractively on the top of the highest hill in its region. The entrance to the town he called Asia was through a spacious avenue of noble trees, and Kiadu was seated on a gentle declivity. Usually too, the towns were clean. Lander spoke of hill slopes and valleys studded with cleanly, sick, habitations. Most of the bigger towns, according to Lander, were walled. Some of the towns of the thick forests near the coast were defended by a strong stockade or a mud wall, and sometimes by both together. But most town walls consisted of a thick mud wall and deep trench. 
In many towns the wall was shielded by trees of large dimensions, planted so as to form a belt, which in case of necessity might easily be converted into an excellent means of defense. At another place, he wrote, Atipa, like most towns of any magnitude in the country, is furnished with a strong wall, made of earth, and a belt of trees within it, by reason of a thorny creeping shrub climbing round the trunks, like the ivy to the oak, and throwing out vigorous shoots, had become so thickly entangled as to form a secure barrier which, except by the narrow gateway at the entrance, was impervious to man and beast. Lander noted the public shrines in some of the towns. Of the town which he called Bukhar he wrote, near the entrance of the town, on the left side of the road, stands a solitary fetish hut, of large dimensions, with a number of wooden figures, carved in base relief, some in a kneeling and some in a recumbent posture, placed outside the walls, these idols the inhabitants worship, and ascribe miraculous powers to their agency. In the beautiful walk of trees which formed the approach to the town of Labu, there were between the trees fetish houses which are held in greatest veneration by the inhabitants. Outside the Dogri, the Clapperton group saw a solitary fetish hut, ornamented in front with a species of small shining stones which abounds in this country. Finally, Clapperton and his companions caught some glimpses of Yorubard in a few places. The wooden images which they saw outside the wall of the big shrine at Bukhar were no doubt part of the artistic decorations of the shrine. In a town which Lander called Nguai, they saw several busts of men, as well as figures of tigers, crocodiles, serpents, carved of blocks of wood, and extremely well executed. Then Lander added, the natives of that part of Africa appear to have a genius for the art of sculpture, which is in great repute with them, and some of their productions rival, in point of delicacy, any of a similar kind that I have seen in Europe. Concerning the inhabitants of these towns and villages, Lander had varied remarks. Sometimes, he could not understand the ways of his hosts and, therefore, occasionally allowed himself to lapse into rude, ethnocentric comments. He was, in particular, sometimes irritated by the crowds which gathered to gaze at members of his group, even when they were trying to sleep, and by the fact that he and the other members of his group were called red men. He was frustrated too because, for most of the way, they could not find men to bear hammocks for pay. We were, he wrote on one occasion, unfortunate in our inquiries for hammock men, not a single individual in the town being willing to engage himself in what all ranks conceived to be an occupation fit only for horses. In one town, some young men did agree to carry Clapperton in a hammock. Clapperton got into the hammock and they lifted it onto their shoulders, but, wrote Lander, the bearers had proceeded only a few paces when it was, for some unaccountable reason, suddenly let, it, down, and the fellows scampered away as fast as their leg could carry them. However, Lander's team had no difficulty whatsoever about recruiting carriers to carry their loads. More generally, however, Lander was appreciative of the people whose towns and villages he passed through. His assessment was that the inhabitants, pay the greatest respect to the laws, and live under a regular government. A few incidents illustrated the orderly government. All the way from Badagri to Oyoila, Clapperton and his companions regularly found agencies and evidence of orderly control by the government of Oyoila and by the local governments. When they came to a district where Fulani rebels from Iloran had attacked and burned villages, they found that the royal government of Oyoila had provided armed guards to protect traders and travelers on the roads. Lander wrote, we passed several hundred of men, women and children, with heavy loads on their heads, who had been traveling the whole of the previous night. They were carefully watched by overseers, one of whom was appointed to each fifty, who were all armed, either with short swords or bows and arrows. Lander also found the people generally very hospitable, cheerful and good-natured. He wrote we experienced as much civility from them as our countrymen would have bestowed upon us in our native land. They were, generally speaking, neatly dressed in cap, shirt, toby, and trousers, and very cleanly in their personal appearance. The large town of Ihumbo had just suffered some aggression, the political troubles of the 19th century had already started in that locality, and much of it was in ruins. Nevertheless, the people showed as much friendliness and hospitality as if there was no problem singing and dancing and music playing were kept up during the whole night, with as much spirit and good humor, as if the people had been the happiest in the world. At Asa Udo he remarked that the people were pleasing in their manner. The people of the towns they passed through in one district all bore an air of novelty, cheerfulness, beauty, and grandeur, that I have never seen surpassed. In general, we were everywhere received on the road with acclamations and songs of welcome. He found that the Yoruba were a very musical and happy people. In town after town, his group was surrounded by crowds of men, women and children, the ladies enlivening us with song, and the men blowing on horns and beating on gongs and drums. In one town, 
their hosts liberally offered an intoxicating beverage called O.T., a kind of ale made from millet, which made everybody lightheaded and cheerful. When Clapperton fell sick in one town, the local herbalist gave him a potion to drink which worked like magic. King after king welcomed them with touching kindness and some of Yoruba royal grandeur. While they waited to be ushered into the presence of the king of Vienna, the women of the palace struck up a native tune, which they sang loudly and with much feeling. Lander added, there was a solemnity and pathos about it that reminded me of the most impressive church music in my own country. When the women stopped singing, the band played a lively air, in which the singers occasionally joined, and at the conclusion of the concert a message was sent from the king, for the red men to make their appearance. When they were ushered before the king of Shaki, the king was seated under his veranda, surrounded by a hundred of his wives and musicians and drums and fifes, the latter struck up a native air, the ladies keeping time with their feet and accompanying the instruments with their voices. In many places on the journey, kings and chiefs kindly led horses to the Clapperton team. Generally, Lander had much to admire in the kings. He said of the king of Biji that he was a fine young man named Lalakeli. At Bukhar not far from Badagri, Lander wrote that when the visitors were invited before the king, we found, him, in earnest conversation with his elders, altogether forming the most venerable-looking group of human beings I ever saw. For more details he added that the king was a tall thin man, well stricken in years, and respectably dressed in a silk toby and trousers of country cloth. On his head he wore a cap thickly studded with various colored glass beads. And small gold-colored tassels of beads hung from it to the shoulders. The cap was neatly and fancifully made. After one of his visits to the Alaf in Majatu in 1826, Lander wrote as follows, The monarch was richly dressed in a scarlet damask toby, ornamented with coral beads, and short trousers of the same color with a light blue stripe, made of country cloth, his legs as far as the knees were stained red with henna, and on his feet he wore sandals of red leather. A cap of blue damask, thickly studded with handsome coral beads, was on his head, and his neck, arms and legs were decorated with large silver rings. We will conclude this picture of Yoruba land from Lander's account with his description of a scene of some Yoruba girls in carefree recreation at a beautiful spot just outside the walls of their town, not far from Oyoila in January 1826. Lander wrote, on Sunday January 22, 1826. At noon we descended into a delightful valley, situated in the bottom of a ridge of rocks, which effectually hid it from observation till one approached almost close to it. It was intersected with shimmering streams and purling reels, the elegant palm, and the broad-leaved banana, covered with foliage, embellishing the sheltered and beautifully romantic spot. In the center was a sheet of water, resembling an artificial pond, in which were numbers of young maidens from the neighboring town of Chow, some of them reposing at full length on its verdant banks, and some frisking and basking in the sunbeams, whilst others of their companions were sporting with the naiads, sick, of the sacred stream, but all of them visibly delighted with the pleasant recreations which they were enjoying so prettily and innocently. We stood for a season gazing on them with pleasure, but no sooner were our white faces observed by the young ladies, than their amusements instantly ceased, and the sable beauty simultaneously rushing from the water snatched up their apparel, and with their uncovered associates, concealing their faces with their hands, ran away and hid themselves behind the trunk of trees, looking as coy and bashful as did their mother even the Garden of Eden. All these accounts by Richard Lander, then, represent what most of Yoruba land would have been like by the end of the 18th century except that the few ruins of towns and villages which Lander saw along his way would not have featured. Much further to the east, in the Igbomina country, a traveler would have seen some ruins and encountered some wars in the last decades of the 18th century the effects, as will be seen in a later chapter, of noop incursions. Earlier in the 18th century, say by 1750, however, a traveler through Igbomina would not have seen any towns or villages devastated by new parades. All indications are that, through most of the 18th century, at the peak of many centuries of prosperous growth, most of Yoruba land was a country of happy, productive and hospitable people, a land of farmers, artisans, craftsmen, and caravans of traders, of crowded marketplaces, of musicians, artists and storytellers, of what Lander called regular government, and of law, peace, and order. The growth and development of the wealth in the visual arts and in folklore, for which the Yoruba had become famous worldwide, belonged mostly to these centuries up to the 18th. The order and prosperity resulting from the rise of many towns and cities all over Yoruba land and the culture of beauty and grandeur which became the character of the monarchical establishments, enhanced the flowering of artistic expression. Of Yoruba sculptural art in metals, especially in brass, bronze and iron, many of the pieces on display in our times have been found in the city of Ila Ife. 
but that high quality of art and metals was a nationwide phenomenon. Most towns that were major centers of trade were also major centers of art for example Owo, Ijebuode, Ouaipol, many of the Igba towns, many of the Akiti towns, Odondo, Ila and many towns in Igbomna. Lander's statement about a genius for the art of sculpture was true of the people of all Yoruba communities. Countless pieces of impressive carving in wood have been found in all parts of Yoruba land, especially from shrines, palaces and lineage compounds. The staff of Ornmi and Anila Ife represents the highest in extant Yoruba monumental sculpture in stone. But sculpture in stone was common to all parts of the country. Across the country, countless shrines had stone images of Orisa, sometimes riding on a horse, and human guards, called Adena. In the Igbomina town of Ezi in northeastern Yoruba land, there exists in one location a large collection of impressive stone carvings, about 1,000 in all, all of them figures of humans variously dressed and adorned most with prominent headgear and beaded accessories and many representing various social roles chiefs, priests, warriors, etc. Many questions remain difficult to answer concerning these sculptures. They appear to have been gathered together from different places, but it is not known from where, when, or for what purpose. There is no doubt that they were produced by artists of the Igbomina and Ibolo areas scattered pieces of similar stone sculpture have been found in some places in the general part of the country. Virtually all pieces in the collection are damaged a fact which seems to indicate that they were probably gathered in distressed circumstances, like flight from war, or that the collection was set upon for destruction after it was gathered together. While these and other questions remain unanswered, however, there is no doubt that these stone images of Easy represent very significant examples of the best in Yoruba sculptural art in stone. As Drool, Pemberton and Abiodun note in their monumental book on Yoruba art, the Yoruba-speaking peoples of Nigeria and the popular Republic of Benin, together with their countless descendants in other parts of Africa and the Americas, have made remarkable contributions to world civilization. In the arts, the Yoruba are heirs to one of the oldest and finest artistic traditions in Africa. Most of that great artistic tradition of the Yoruba people was accomplished in the urban civilization of the Yoruba kingdoms.